So we're recording. So awesome. Michael Tobin in the house. Thank you for coming on to the podcast. I know we've known each other for quite some time, but um, for those of you that you know have, don't know who you are, because I think uh, a lot of our I think a lot of our audiences kind of there is some overlap. So kind of give an introduction to who you are and uh, and yeah, we can get into it. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, yeah, definitely. It has been a couple of years now, huh? That we've known each other. Uh, so yeah, I'm another uh, commercial filmmaker from Columbus. Um, and basically started out in kind of doing freelance stuff just on the side, went full time a couple of years ago, just doing some uh, mostly product promos and uh, commercials. Those are my favorite things to do. Uh, back in the day, did still photography for wedding and events, all the cliche stuff that people usually start with. And um, yeah, the past year I kind of left the commercial realm for the most part. And now I'm just focused on YouTube and building that up, you know, Corona forced a lot of people to adapt and I just saw it as an opportunity to go all in on what I really wanted to do in life. So that's what I'm doing. And how, how has that, like that whole transition been, you know, even before, cause I even think even before COVID and whatnot, you were kind of already, you know, headed towards that. So what's, what's that been like for you, uh, you know, kind of coming up in the, you know, content creation space and just kind of like owning your, you know, be, being the, the, the platform, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's had its up and downs. I'm sure as every creator has had. And I think one too many times I've had that moment where like a video or an event will happen where I'm like, Oh, this is it. This is like my Peter McKinnon moment where everything's about to skyrocket. And then you upload the next video and it like tanks or something. It's like, okay, we're not quite there yet. Uh, and so it's been many years of that, but, uh, I think the biggest thing that's changed in the past year, honestly, was just a simple mindset change. Cause for technically my channel started, I uploading consistently quote unquote was around 2016, but 2019 at the end of it, I remember being like, Oh, maybe I should just like give up. Uh, this YouTube thing or do it more on the side. And I looked back at the analytics for 2019 and I realized that I only had uploaded like 11 times. I'm like, well, that's, that's not enough. I'm not Mark Rober or whatever. So, uh, you know, it, it kind of allowed, forced me to look in the mirror and be like, oh, you know, this is my own fault for not growth. It's not blaming the algorithm and all that. So the past, I don't know, six, seven, eight months or so, I've really just been focused on like, hey, this is what's working. You know, it's a balance of playing the game and doing what you love to create. Um, and so it's been fun, but definitely more growth has happened in the past six or seven months than in the past four years combined. So, yeah, I mean, and, and talk about that a little bit, because like you said, it's not, you know, it's not like you just started doing videos. Yeah, in the last in the last <laughs> six, seven months, you know, so it's it's been you know, a, a long process to, to get to this point. So can you, I mean, even kind of going back to that, how do you even get started into, you know, the whole content creation and, and just, you know, cinematography? Because were you, you know, you obviously were doing that before, you know, even start, you started creating like your own personal videos and whatnot. So talk a little bit about how, you know, you got started with that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm one of those kids who pretty much from third or fourth grade knew I wanted to be a filmmaker. Obviously at that time being a YouTuber or content creator wasn't a thing. Um, but I just kind of always went towards, you know, whatever path allowed me to use a camera. And so that's why I didn't bother with college or anything like that, just cause I knew it wasn't a necessity for what I wanted to do. So I feel lucky that I've always known what I wanted to do. And, then we were talking right before we started recording about how like, oh, like, you know, didn't really love being in front of the camera. And so when I started, you can definitely tell in my early videos that I'm uncomfortable and still to this day, you know, people call me monotone and still have things that I'm working on and fixing. But uh, I really just love the mix of playing around with products. I've always loved unboxing stuff and playing around with new tech and cameras and things. And so uh, then I'm like, hey, why not record this? And I see other people making a living off that. And so it kind of turned into like, oh, yeah, I guess I do want to be a YouTuber because the traditional film path of 
oh, let me become a PA and then, you know, slowly work my way up to like DP in like the traditional Hollywood sense. It's still fun. I enjoy being on traditional sets. Um, but I think in, I, was, I saw it in Peter McKinnon's, one of his like holiday videos when he did the big Hyundai thing, how much of like a culture shock it is, the difference between like a YouTuber who's just like, this is the video I want to make. I'm just going to go out and make it and then publish it all on my own versus having a crew of like 20 or 50 people that, you know, weeks and months go into creating something. And so there's like two different paths and it's fun to play around with, with each one. But I think uh, for me, I like just being able to fully just think of an idea and, and create it and, and publish it. But yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting just seeing like even the difference with that, where, you know, they are, you ultimately, you know, you end up with a, you know, a video at the end, but there's totally the, the process. There are a lot of similarities, but it's very different. And, mm-hmm. you know, you even talked about, you know, just being on a traditional set. It's just the, the whole dynamic is, is, is totally different. So, you know, what's what was what, you know, did you experience that first or? or? Yeah, I, I had been on a couple of sets just uh, again, growing up, that's what I wanted to do. And so any chance I got to be on one. So, uh, starting, I don't even, I'm always bad at remembering ages, but young teenager, I hounded basically every video production company in town and a couple of them would let me just like go on shoots. And I was the equivalent of a PA, but not officially anything, just kind of hanging out and seeing how things work. And there was a lot of parts that I really liked. There were parts that I didn't like, like there's a lot of waiting around a lot of, you know, seeing like, the whole like union aspect of it of like, oh, if this isn't your job, don't touch the light stand or like don't set up the camera. And like, I like wearing multiple hats. And so I was always so impatient to climb the ladder or to um, only do one job for one project. Like, uh, you know, I just, when I look at something in a project, I just want to like go do jump as deep as I can and, and go right into it. And so being a content creator, I feel like you can do that a lot more. Um, and my long-term goal of still wanting to do like higher end commercials, like we see for Nike and Apple and those lifestyle, really dramatic, like Super Bowl type commercials. I would love to make one of those. And I've seen a lot of content creators almost go around all the people who like slowly climb the ladder. Like it doesn't happen all the time, but you know, we see like Daniel Schiffer, right? Like obviously he was doing commercial work or freelance at one point. And then he was like, I'll start YouTube. And he made all these videos and now he's huge and companies will happily hire him to do these big productions. And who knows if that would have taken the same amount of time if he never uploaded to YouTube and became a public face. So um, like you and I were briefly talking about before, I think it was just one of those like necessities where I'm like, I don't care to be in front of the camera, but if I want this life, then I kind of just have to. And uh, now, like, I enjoy it. It's fun. Um, but there's nothing like still being behind the camera and everything. So, yeah, I mean, I even think it's interesting because, I mean, even us here having this conversation now is is kind of me working on being more comfortable with being in front of the camera or being more of the voice um, and and being, you know, in, you know, in front or being, you know, the the attention grabber, right? Um, the face on the icon. The, 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 <laughs> you know, being the face of the thing, right? And like, I'm totally not used to that. And and this is me challenging myself to want to get comfortable with it because even with COVID and everything else, I, I feel like as anybody who has any kind of like influence, like it, there's, there's so much to gain from like creating your own content and even being able to like kind of what you alluded to earlier where you have control over creating what you want to create. Um, that's that's been something you know I I want to start doing more of where I don't want to be I want to be able to if I have an idea or I want to make something I want to be able to just go ahead and do it as opposed to you know you have to go through like all these like all this red tape and all these different you know operating procedures and sometimes you know like I've I've been on projects that don't come out for six seven months or some don't even come out at all because you know the funding got canceled or they decided to go a different way and um even in the world of commercial work and and doing client work you know you're not sure you can you have some creative say and and you can have a lot of creative control over creating the thing but it's there's nothing nothing compares to 
you ideating your own thing and, and executing it and making it happen at your own pace. And, and ultimately like you're responsible for, you know, for everything and, and like the success or the, like the lack of, of success. So, I mean, and, and something I, I, I've always admired from you is that like, even before, you know, the, the big growth that you've had this past year, you know, you were always not as consistent as you are now, but you had some consistency and you were putting out, creating content and, and, and doing things that you wanted to create. So, you know, talk a little bit about that, about what, what triggered you to, you know, start being a little bit, I guess, talking about the, the consistency, you know, uh, to, you know, this year, like this podcast, um, it's coming up now officially on a year. Um, this is, you know, uh, I guess I haven't really even, this is like the really first one that I record here in this office space, but, you know, now I'm here in an office space, uh, you know, want to make it a little bit more presentable and have something that I'm not doing in my basement. And, you know, we can talk a little bit about that, about the challenges <laughs> of, you know, having kids at home and being limited with space. But, you know, for me, I, I have struggled with being consistent. I'm sure everybody has, you know, to, 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 any, to any extent, but it's, you know, real for me has been like, hey, like, this is your thing. You wanted to do this. And like, if you wanted to succeed or you want to have something come out of it, then you need to put in the work and like make it fucking happen. Because I've, you know, and like even with this here, that's one of the, the reasons why I ended up getting into the space is like, okay, well, now I have to pay you know, pay rent. And for me, I find it's a little bit of more of a motivation for me to, sure. to make it more, more worthwhile. And, you know, how, how, how do you approach that? You know, you mentioned that, you know, you realize, oh, you know, after you know, four or five years of creating, you know, videos, not as consistent as you should be, you know, you were, you know, concerned about the growth or you weren't growing as much as you want. So like what triggered you to, to really um, maintain that consistency and to like even just change how you approach, you know, sure. thinking about your success? Yeah. So, uh, there's a handful of things and probably the biggest has to do with who you like surround yourself with. Right. And the, the people who give you feedback and critiques and push you, um, not necessarily to like force you in a certain direction, but I have a couple, uh, like YouTube mentors, so to speak, as well as, uh, my wife who, always pushes me. She's a very analytical person. And so the channel over the years, I always tried to chase after what everyone else was doing. So, uh, I, there's like, I don't remember what year, I mean, 2017, 2018, I did like a handful of vlogs in there, uh, on the channel, random product reviews that had nothing to do with what people really liked. And so what I was talking about before where you could have a video pop off and maybe it was like, I don't know, an iPhone video. And then the next one I would do on some like some obscure, like maybe phone gimbal or I don't even know what, but something totally different and it would flop before I would just be like, oh, well, like I'll try next time. But in the past year, I've just been trying to be more strategic and and look at what do people actually come to my channel for? And I found that the niche is like, oh, phone cameras. People really like the, you know, I'm not a guy who just like uses the basic phone camera. I like to rig it up and make it absurd. So I hook it up to all these lenses and not many people are doing that. And then I was like, I'm pretty bored of reviewing phones in terms of like battery life tests and phone performance. Cause pretty much all phones nowadays are pretty good at right. the regular stuff. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to like lean into that. So now in videos, I'm just like, I don't care about 99% of this phone. This video is just on, on the camera on it. And each one of those videos has done really well for the past year. And, uh, and then a couple computer things and, and, and other topics. But if I start to stray too far, I was just, my wife was texting me uh, before I started doing this about that. Like, Hey, it's been 46 days since your last like phone camera thing. And uh, so having people around you that kind of can give you genuine feedback about like what your channel, what is working on your channel. And it just so happens that uh, I like making that. And so it's the perfect combination because if you're trying to chase after what everyone else is doing but you don't enjoy doing it, you well, you know as well as I do that you're going to burn out, you're going to get bored of it, and consistency won't happen. And then the other thing is I'm really bad at like planning. Like I hate writing schedules and just 
detailed daily checklists and stuff. Like I am terrible at that. I hate doing that. Um, my wife tries to do it for me half the time, uh, just to force me to be like, Hey, by noon today, try to have like this done. And so I forget it was in a clubhouse a couple weeks ago. I heard another creator talk about how, like, if nothing else, just have like a deadline, uh, for when you upload, like if that's your one piece of organization, it's just like next Friday, this video is being uploaded. I don't care if it's a rough cut that has half the color graded footage, um, and like just upload it on that day and that time. And so that's what I've been trying, especially the past month is trying to get on, um, more of a schedule like, okay, like every Friday have a video come out and not necessarily announce it to the world. Cause I think we've all done that as crews. Like, okay, this is my new channel Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays videos are coming out. You do that for like a week. And then by the next one, it's just, yeah, totally. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of that here with this podcast. I mean, even this episode now that, you know, we're recording, I, I haven't put out a podcast episode in over a month. And yeah, um, it started off, you know, I had big backlog. I was every other week. Then it yeah. became once a week. And then now it's been once a month. And now it's kind of like going on two months. And, and that's one of the things for me that I've realized, like, hey, um, if this is what you want to do, like, you need to, you know, step up and come to back like sure you know it's if especially and that's one of the things like when it's your own thing like if you don't show up then nobody else is gonna come do it for you so sure. it's uh it's it's well and i'm curious your opinion too on because i go back and forth on this again there's the analytical analytical like seo back end of youtube people that i talk to who have very large channels and they're like oh you have this amount of videos to where like the algorithm will boost this, or if you do this, it will boost this. And, um, you know, kind of giving tips from pure analytical point. And then you have the super creative people where it's like, it doesn't matter how often you actually upload. If you upload super amazing content, you're going to blow up. And I think like both are a little true. So like for me, it's like, I'm sure if I could create a, um, I don't even know whose name to throw out there, but some sort of, uh, he, um, nope, can't remember his name. Uh, Ash Taylor. Uh, you probably remember him too. He doesn't upload to YouTube anymore, unfortunately, but he grew very quickly. And I know he didn't really look at analytics of anything. He just made really good pieces of content, but pretty inconsistently. Um, but I think for the majority of us who just make good content, and sometimes trying to achieve that uh, standing out stuff, it's just about keeping it as consistent as you can and not paying too much attention, not becoming overly obsessed with the analytics, but also not being overly obsessed with like perfecting a video. Yeah, I mean, I think it really boils down to at the end of the day, as long as you're doing what, you know, what's in your heart to like want to create and, you know, sure, you know, people... I think you have to be an analytical to a sense if if that's what you're trying to achieve. And, and that's, you know, obviously you, you're going after whatever metrics or KPIs or whatnot that sure you have to think about that. But I don't think that should dictate what you, you know, whether you create something or, or not. And I, I think at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've had videos or projects that you've performed that you've thought like yeah it's not that good it's not my best work but then it's received totally differently or, oh dude that's people how, love it that's how it works like all the time and it annoys the heck out of me half the time because yeah i'll put in like oh, i forget which video it was um but there there was a video that i literally put in i think i calculated like 30 plus hours into and i put it out there and it did like okay it was pretty slow growth over the month and then there was like a new camera announcement and I didn't even have my hands on it. I just did like a quick talking head of like, Hey, here's my reaction to like, you know, the announcement. And it was just like a simple talking head video. And that one took off cause you know, it was a trending topic or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's definitely like you can't take, whether it's comments, whether it's how, how your video does, like you can't dwell too much. And that's why people quit. And that's why people don't get into it in the first place is like, there's going to be a lot of negative, but you just got to like keep doing what you love. And my like metric of uh, if I'll keep doing this or whatever is like, if you won the lottery tomorrow, would you keep 
doing X, Y, and Z. To me, it's like, yeah, like my channel will be a lot cooler because I'd, you know, be driving up in a Lamborghini or something, (laughs) but like I would still be creating. I would still do that. I wouldn't be like, okay, screw this YouTube thing. I'm just going to go retire on a beach somewhere. Yeah. I mean, and I think like even some people, a lot of people give up because they don't realize, um, yeah, they, that's, it's not in it to like want to do this. They don't want, they don't really want that lifestyle. They just want like whatever comes out of it. And like, I, you know, I've been guilty about, about that before where, you know, thinking, oh, okay, I'm just going to do this thing because it's going to, you know, lead to this opportunity or I'm going to, you know, get something out of it as opposed to like, okay, well, I'm doing this because I want to, you know, one of the reasons why I started the podcast, I listen to podcasts a lot. I just like talking to people. So right now I really don't care if, if it takes off, great. If it doesn't, at the end of the day, like I'm content with being able to sit down and have a conversation with you. And, and it's, even even with the, with the podcast, I want people to listen, of course, and I want them to be able to take something tangible away from listening to it. Um, but at the same time, like I feel like this, me and you talking right now is doing is going to do a lot more for me. What it's it's going to do the same thing for me whether a thousand people listen to it or ten thousand people listen to it. Sure, because um, you know, with every every guest that I've had, I've been able to walk away with not only knowing them a little bit more, but really. A, able being able to take away things that I can apply to my process and to, to my journey that will help me. And ultimately I'm like, if it's helping me, you know, with this kind of thing, I'm hundred yeah. percent sure that it's going to help out somebody else. And it's so true. Cause that's like really the networking aspect is like such a close second to the good feeling of, uh, like actually filming something to me, like me holding a camera in my hands and getting a cool shot is like the greatest like feeling ever for me. But, uh, like, having the chance to meet people and like, like you said, sit down, talk to you or go to networking events, or even if it's just chatting on Twitter or Instagram with someone, when you do spend the time to create a platform for yourself or whatever, you know, even if your motivation isn't to be like the biggest influencer or whatever, because maybe you're more shy or whatever, having some sort of following gives you credibility And it allows other people to see like, oh, let me scroll through this person's stuff and uh, kind of see like, oh, this is like a like minded person. I mean, heck, that's like we didn't just meet, you know, in a coffee shop somewhere. We met in a like minded scenario and and that's how we became friends and and started talking more and stuff. And and so over the years, the amount of people that I've been able to talk to, whether it was once or multiple times or things like that is just really cool. And I know you're the same way with both youtube and and content creation stuff and also your professional work i'm sure you know you've always told me about a lot of the really cool people you've met and um it's awesome to have the opportunity to do what you love and meet really cool people and like you said walk away from those conversations feeling inspired motivated or learning something new and tactile tactical yeah, I mean, with I mean, and honestly, like without that, like I really don't think there's there's only so much there's only so much that you can do with your by yourself, and and sure, you know, the whole creating for yourself, it's it's kind of like a lonely, you know, it's it's a lonely world, especially when you're in your basement in the dark, just editing away nights on it. Right. So it so it's it's pretty cool that it's uh it it's for me it's it's wild how seeing how yes this is all very lonely and you know a lot of the things especially YouTubers a lot of them don't have big crews or a, you know, large a staff or people that are doing everything. You're kind of literally doing everything yourself that being able to, you know, just connect with others that are in the same environment or have experienced similar things. Like there's, yeah. Like you just kind of instantly like, Oh yeah, I understand what that's like. And you just have this like mutual bond that, you know, you, you're able to just hit it off off of that um, and be able to learn from each other. So it, it's, I, I think it's amazing how, it's so important being able to, you know, just connect with others that are, you know, like you said, like-minded and not only for growth, but just to like have a, have a sanity check from time to time, because, you know, sometimes I, I, I think, uh, you know, at least for me, I don't know about you, but like I struggle with, uh, not, not, Sure. I, I don't I don't do it as much now where like you see somebody's work and like you kind of do like the whole consp- comparison thing like, oh, I, you know, oh, yeah, they did that great thing for me. A, a lot of times I see when I see great work, I get motivated to like, oh, get my shit together and like actually, you know, 
hey, like I, you know, so and so did this cool thing. Like I want to be able to do something, not necessarily like as a competition to like get better, but like I use that as a motivation for myself. But you know, having a having a network of of other individuals that are like like minded, you're able to kind of not only hold yourself accountable to an extent, but also be able to like just push yourself to be better and and you know and get better every day. Because otherwise, like you know, you're don't have you know, you don't really have anything to like compare yourself with. Yeah. And that's a he- very healthy mindset, I think, because in addition to, again, last later last year, becoming more strategic in what videos I do and when to upload and length of videos and, and all that stuff, that's more of a um, strategic tactical stuff of, of how to handle YouTube. The other biggest shift was I was like, I need to erase the... Uh, thoughts in my head of constantly comparing to myself to a handful of other creators who are like the same level. And I'm like, Oh, why are they gaining? Like, you know, they're each of their videos is getting X amount of views or, um, you know, so my biggest motivator always was um, <laughs> as many people I'm sure do compare myself to MKBHD Marquez uh, just because, so he's exactly like one month older than me. And I actually, I went back a handful of months ago just uh, for shits and giggles, looked at our first videos, and I uploaded mine technically a day before he did. I had a lens review on another channel that's super, I don't even remember the channel name, um, but I am like whispering and, you know, it was literally a day before his. I was like, man, if only, what would have happened if I would have kept uploading videos because i stopped from that was 2009 or it was like january 1st 2009 or something um and you know what would have happened if i never stopped and it's kind of any time nowadays i see the conversation of oh is it too late to start youtube it's like no don't do it and so i just like preach that to anyone and i want to like lovingly punch them in the face of being just like (laughs) please start now because you're like, if this is something you want, you're going to regret it in a year, five years. Cause I remember Casey Neistat was asked like four or five years ago, is it too late to start? Anyone who listened to him then saying like, no, like do it, then they would be somewhere right now potentially. And, uh, today I haven't watched the video yet, but, uh, Maddie uploaded a video saying, or someone like, is it too late to start YouTube? And anytime I see that topic, I'm just like, It's never too late. Like there's always going to be a new set of people. And uh, I'm sure you've seen similar things in all industries, but Michelle and I were just talking about that last night of like, it's like every five to 10 years, like there's always the new group of like new popular people. Right. And you can't wait for like, Oh, Peter McKinnon's spot at the table is like, he's gotten up. He's now on like the, the big kids table. So now I'm going to take his like medium sized table seat. Like you already have to be doing it. And then you can like pop off or, or whatever. You know, what's pretty crazy. Even with like the whole YouTube space or just social media in general, how like, the the large the the insane amount of like niches and like different areas of interest that people gravitate to and like that could be like have a huge amount of success like you know my son and i we've been mountain biking for the past year and even as we're like looking at new bikes and and you know oh what trails to ride and how do you do this how do you do that like you know just like the whole tech to youtube world there's a whole like mountain bike youtube world oh and like yeah. there's guys who get like tens of millions of views there's like the big channels like you said like all the different areas and like it's 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 pretty wild that you know like you hear gary v and others talk about it all the time that there's it is really no in no if if you're interested about something like you need to be able to just create around that and and be able you know just yeah. start making shit literally um two creators in columbus uh she's not doing a channel anymore but It's a husband and wife. Uh, They had multiple channels, all around a million subscribers. And she cleaned houses. uh, She cleaned her house and made videos on that, like just literally time lapses. And the husband, he he still runs his channel, Stoffer Garage, just crossed over a million uh, at the beginning of the year. And he just details cars and basically just, they're like 30 minute, basically just time lapse videos with like VOs and stuff. 
And it's just really funny because we've explained it to family of like, oh, they make how much like per year doing that? And it's like, yeah, like cleans her house and films it and he details cars and and films it. And it like, you know, a lot of people make them sick. And obviously it's not as simple as that. We know what goes into what making a channel. Um, but like you said, like, yeah, if if your passion is like sanding down wood tables or something like film it and heck there's restoration chat like that's a whole subculture of of youtube i've gotten down that rabbit hole and been like why am i watching an <laughs> hour of someone restoring this hundred year old bell but i'm gonna sit there and like watch it and just be mesmerized by it dude we've uh, uh my son and i we watch these videos of of uh guys who assemble bikes nice. and it's like no no dialogue it's just like some cinematic music and it's all like super slow motion and all you hear is like you know the torque you know the torque wrench is click clacking and like you know the 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 bolt you know as as you're putting everything together like it's like a 45 minute video of guys just literally just assembling a bike and has like 10 million views and it's oh yeah <laughs> or those guys uh i'm not sure what country but uh clearly like a third world country setup and it's just like the this guy there's a couple channels now but like this couple with, guys where they like build like structures and like houses and stuff with yeah. like their bare hands or like a wooden <laughs> yeah like it looks like they have a spork in their hands and they'll build like a million dollar swimming pool and it's just like you said time lapses all you hear is like dirt being shuffled and some music and they all have like a hundred million views yeah. it's it's wild and like I, I wonder if if you know because of the ability of like all these different subcultures and like area of interest that people think it's a lot simpler to okay well oh i like i like watching tv so i'm gonna you know start a youtube channel on watching tv but and, and i think that's probably why a lot of people because they think it's easy and then once they start doing it like realize oh okay it's not as it's not as easy as i thought and sometimes they you know kind of going back to the whole thing where they start creating this thing because of they're chasing the fame or whatever money and they don't really have the you know, that, that love or that passion to, sure. you know. Did, did you see that thing on Twitter a couple of days ago? It made me piss off. It got super uh, uh, retweeted and liked. And I don't even know who it was, but they basically were like, oh, this is sad. And it was a chart about, um, and I've seen it before, so I think it's a couple of years old, but it was basically like this um, quit, not quiz. Um, oh my gosh, what's it called? Kids were basically asked what they wanted to become when they were older. And the leading uh, answer was YouTuber. And below that was like I don't know, blogger, Instagram model, something like that. But basically all variations of content creation. And it was like, oh, this is so sad. Like all of the big industries aren't going to be there anymore. And I'm just like, well, first of all, you don't know what goes into YouTube because when you're a YouTuber, you are also like an entrepreneur, your marketer, your digital, all the hats. But then also there are scientists who are also YouTubers. There are, um, you know, engineers and construction people. And like, like you said, every single industry has content creators. And so it's, it's not like if, and it's understandable that any kid or, or young person i just super sounded old there uh <laughs> wants to get into it because yeah they see all the flashy stuff and then you'll have the people who try to start and be like oh this isn't that easy and then they stop and go do whatever else they want which is fine um or they adapt and learn how to really get into all this so it's it's a lot of fun and it's in my opinion one of the most rewarding if you like break through um and can make like a sustainable living off of it and you don't have to be the Marquezes and Casey Neistats and of the world to make a living. And um, it's it's crazy. The more in recent months, the more I've learned from other creators who are smaller, sub 100K and still make very good money. And it's like, wow, if you really like play the game right or whatever you want to say, uh, you can really, really uh, make a good life for yourself. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that, too? You know, you obviously you don't have to give specifics, but... You know, obviously there there is, you know, you don't have to have millions of subscribers or followers to, you know, start making a living. Like what are, you know, what are different ways that people can can start, you know, generating different, you know, revenue streams and and 
you know, sure, you may not be paying all your bills, but as you start creating for yourself and, and doing these different things, exploring these different areas of interest, um, you know, what are different ways and how do you, how do, how does somebody even go about start yeah. monetizing? And, and I think the biggest thing to realize is that YouTube and being a content creator, it's really just a big snowball. Some people's builds up really fast. Some people's take longer, you know, like mine takes years or whatever. But if you keep pushing at it and keep growing, no matter how slow or fast, everything will grow. So if you get monetized, you have AdSense, you have Amazon affiliates and other affiliate programs, sponsorships. And I always thought that there was like a certain threshold that you really, especially sponsorships. Like I just started getting into that and I'm like regretting just getting into it because I've talked to other creators who are my size and um, they're like, Oh, I got my first sponsorship deal at like 5,000 subscribers. And you know, it may only be a couple hundred bucks. And, but I've heard so many people be like, Oh, it's, you know, I only made 50 bucks on Amazon affiliate this month or something like that. And it's like, why are you sad about that? Like that could be something extra that could pay your like internet bill. Like it's something. And that's like, especially affiliate links, that is fully passive. And so as you grow your channel and you get views and you get AdSense and things like that, um, I've always seen everything grow with that. There are months where things dip and go all over the place. But for the most part, it's like, huh, everything is kind of growing together. And now I've two smaller channels that I technically started like last year that I'm trying to going back to the consistency thing, just finding the time for everything. Um, they just got monetized last month. And so now I'm like, okay, now I'm really wanting to like feed into those. And um, odds are those will grow faster than my one main channel one. Cause I've learned a lot. So I know how to do things better, but also because um you know, again, just because I have a platform on my main channel, I can be like, Hey, go watch this video and it will feed people faster to that. So, um, yeah, I think just getting as many revenue streams as possible without, um, you know, making sure that you have time for everything and not signing up. Don't, I mean, the biggest thing is don't sign up for an MCN. Like I never did that. I don't know if you ever did that. But uh, if you're just getting into YouTube, like the one piece of advice that everyone gives, never sign up for an MCN because uh, they don't do a whole lot and they'll just take like 40% of your profits or I don't know the percentages, it's but wild. it's I mean, crazy. I've, I've had I've had a couple, you know, hit me up a couple yeah. of years ago and like even when like with my channel, like my channel is like monetized and it's wild because I don't really create content. So initially when I first made my YouTube channel, I was shooting music videos for people. And I was literally the platform where these music videos would get distributed. Nice. So I would shoot a music video, post a music video and started gaining some kind of audience. But then somehow, I don't know, I, I don't even remember why, but I just like stopped doing that because I was like, eh, I don't want to post these music videos on my channel anymore. So like I've kind of even right now with this here, like I've kind of I'm like in this weird position where I'm like, OK, can I? should I even just like start a brand new channel and start fresh with everything that I'm doing here with the podcast and even like some of the personal content that I want to create um, or just leverage that, Hey, this channel is kind of like already monetized and, and start just building it from there with the understanding that a lot of the people that initially subscribe or even watch the videos, um, they're not going to care about sure. my new content. Yeah. It's, that is a long like that's a debate that I think been around a long time and I debated it multiple times and, you know, I could even argue that if, you know, two years ago or last year, if I would have been like, okay, I'm going to ditch this channel, start over. Cause there, there is evidence. I'm not going to say for sure. Cause no one, anyone who claims to know the algorithm, you know, it changes so constantly and who knows, but there has been evidence that, uh, really old channels that try to come up with new content or whatever have a harder time than a brand new channel for the number I've heard is around 35 or whatever. The first like 35 videos, YouTube really gives a new channel a chance to like really pop off. And so there was, I forget, Rich, uh, I forget his last name, um, but he had a channel and he's in our space, tech film space, 
and Tom Richardson. Um, and he had a channel with like 60 or 70,000 subscribers. He got really bad at uploading or something, bad consistency for like a year or two, and then started uploading again. And with nearly 70,000 subscribers was getting the same amount of views that I had at around 10, where it was like high hundreds, low thousands, every once in a while one would get five or 10, but it's pretty low for a channel of that size. And so he made the really hard decision. And I remember chatting with him about it on Twitter. He was like, yeah, dude, like I'm just going to start a new channel. And he started a new channel. And like you said, the audience that subscribed to the new channel really wanted to see that content he was creating. And now he's growing faster and he, he hasn't like surpassed his 70,000, but better engagement rates, more comments, more likes, more views, and everything is more proportionate as he grows. And I can only imagine how much that would like, like thinking about being like, okay, I'm going to leave my 36,000 subscribers and like dump it for a brand new channel is, uh, is pretty scary, which is why I kind of started the two smaller channels. Cause like, Oh, those are a little bit more hyper-focused. And so I'll like just upload, uh, to those for a specific type of video. But yeah, it's, it's one of those things that I think you can take an existing channel that hasn't been super like if you're like, oh, my channel's been around for a couple of years and hasn't been optimized the way I would have liked. I think it's still young enough or hasn't been, you know, like killed off by YouTube or anything. So if you start really like, oh, getting consistent and uploading the content that you want to make slash people want to see. Yeah, you may always have like some dead weight of like people who are subscribed who never engaged because I'm still working before last year uh, and most people's is pretty high, but mine was like 99% of viewers not subscribed and like 1% of my subscribers were subscribed. Right. Now it's up to like 6% of people are subscribed, which is getting there. Um but I think like the really good viewerships I've seen are around like 20% of viewers are subscribed um, on channels. So, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, I mean, I even think about like, you know, sometimes when, when thinking about that, like I think about what, you know, what are what are the reasons that like there's some channels that, you know, I like go out of my way to see, okay, what's their new video and like, even even sometimes where oh they haven't put out a video like i'll find myself like going to see oh have they put out anything recently or oh i haven't checked it out in a while so like they have like five videos and like i'll binge watch all those videos and then there's some channels where um like there's a couple like mountain bike you know channels that we watch and every time they come out with a new video like we literally sit down yeah either like I, most of the time i'll probably be in my son's room and we'll like just sit down and, like watch hey hey so and so put out a new video do you want to watch it yeah. And we'll just like sit down and watch it or or even like uh, for a while that we were watching like Mr. Beast videos like religiously just yep. because of like all the off the wall stuff yeah. that they do. They're fun. And they're like they're kind of like family friendly ish, mm-hmm. especially for my kids. They're about that 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 they're that target demographic. So they like they enjoy watching those videos. And like sometimes I'm like, man, like how do they do this shit? And <laughs> it, but it's you know, even thinking about that, like now I'm I'm really starting to, you know, focus more on like, okay, who do I want to see this channel? And like obviously knowing that it's there everybody's not going to come at once the floodgates are not going to open and everybody's going to come in and start watching from day one that um, ultimately build up to the people that i want to watch you know my content whatever it is yeah um so i think that's something like that's very important for people to 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 consider and i don't think a lot of people consider it and that's why a lot of people end up quitting because they're like Oh, I don't want to start brand. I don't want to start fresh. You know, I don't want to start a new Instagram page or YouTube channel or whatever it is because, you know, I don't want to have to work again to build whatever audience or whatever, you know, whatever those follower accounts that yeah. don't, they mean something, but they don't necessarily mean a whole lot. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, just people just need to, you know, have that consistency and do things that, it's going to help them get there. Yeah. And it is hard to, there was a girl I used to edit YouTube videos before and she got, when she was starting out, she got really unfortunate advice from like a social media company. It was like, Oh, you should just buy Instagram followers to like get ahead. And so she bought, um, you know, a couple hundred thousand or something, which is super cheap on Instagram, but she ended up 
getting, you know, argue people say shadow ban doesn't exist. I don't care for the debate, but she wasn't getting nearly the engagement levels because they were mostly fake things. And as over the years, brands have cared less about the initial, you know, subscriber or follower count. And it's more about the engagement. Um, and so they check into that stuff of like, Hmm, you have 200,000 followers, but you have like 50 likes, like what's up with that. And so she had to make the hard decision to like, just ditch it. But again, she's happier than ever with her. I think she built it organically back up to like 10 or 15,000, but really good engagement, really good. And, you know, she gets her sponsorships now that are more genuine and organic and, and yeah, so it, like you said, it is hard to imagine that. And it is a lot of work that uh, you have to re-put back into it, but it can help you out in the long run. And uh, speaking of Mr. Beast, too, one of the YouTubers I edit for sometimes, she actually, I don't know if she hired or just randomly was talking to some of his staff that is like the YouTube strategy team that he has uh, behind the scenes. And one of the biggest tips that she got was that the first two minutes of your videos are like the most important. And now anytime I watch a Mr. Beast video, I just like really pay attention to the first two minutes. And like he really cuts all the BS out. Like that was the biggest thing I've worked on over the years is, you know, I have a video coming out tomorrow that is like my five biggest mistakes as a filmmaker. And one of them is like, don't fall in love with your shots or your edits because we've all like shot a shot where like we just want to let that hold for like a minute long. And I'm so guilty of that, especially for intro shots. I love slow fade ins and stuff. And I'm like, all right, this isn't a movie theater. Like, yes, you can make that stuff. Um, but when you're trying to grow an audience, if someone's new to watching your video, if you're 20 seconds in and you're like halfway faded into like a drone <laughs> shot, like people are going to leave. Yeah. Um and so, yeah, so fun fact for you and anyone listening is straight from Mr. Beast's strategy team is like first two minutes, like make as entertaining as possible. I struggle with that, like even like on client projects and like, uh, you know, client work where um, or even like other projects where you know, like right now I'm doing this thing with Ghost, for Ghost Energy, like a spec project kind of. And I had Johnny uh, uh, come nice. on and like I did a kind of like a talking head story film with him and he had a lot of great things to say about the brand and, and that was ultimately what i wanted to achieve and you know it's my my goal is to like make like a two minute film nice but i have like a half hour like rough cut. well i have this rough cover it's like eight minutes of like very solid like content and i'm like shit this is all really good but like, yeah, nobody's going to watch this. This is why I think doing uh, commercials is a huge benefit because having done commercials for both TV and social media where it has to be like, oh, this has to be 15 seconds or 29 seconds, not a frame more, really forces you to, like, cut it down and ever – I started utilizing that in my film reels where my film reels used to be like two or three minutes, which is still pretty average for a film reel. But then I saw um, the film reel for um, uh, abandoned visuals. I believe it's one of my favorite production companies and theirs is literally 60 seconds long and every shot is like a second or two at most. And they only hold on one or two shots throughout and it just has way more impact. And your really good shots that you fall in love with actually have a bigger impact because they show up real quick and it's like, oh, what was that? But then if you hold it for five seconds, then it's like, oh, what's that? Okay, when's the next shot? I'm kind of bored of this one. So, yeah, it's and that's where, too, having people to, like, look at your rough cuts can be helpful because, yeah, like, you'll look at those eight minutes and be like, oh, dude, this is all such good stuff. And then, like, I may watch it and be like, I fell asleep from minute two through four and like, I don't know, but, uh, yeah, he said something like, yeah, like he said something and yeah, so it's, but I'm sure you can agree as an artist, it's really hard to like not hand it over to someone else to edit, but to at least ha hear those opinions. Cause like, I really like that shot. But if the majority of people are like, yeah, that shot's 
okay or it's garbage and it's like mm. yeah i sent it to, <laughs> to a buddy of mine josh who he he actually helped me like actually produce the the shoot and he was like yeah this is i mean it's great like yeah i mean it's 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 very in line with with what your goals are and what you wanted to do but yeah this could be like a minute and a half yeah and i think i think the hardest thing is everyone says it but very few people follow it where it's like no matter what content you're creating you always want people to want more right so whether it's a commercial or a youtube video or a feature film you want people to end it being like i wish that was 10 hours long but if you actually fulfill like if they were if you fulfilled their appetite it's almost like you did it wrong which like feels weird i don't know maybe maybe i'm wrong about that that just popped into my head but like if, if someone watches something and they're like, oh, I don't want to say any more. That was the perfect amount of time. It's like, oh, it could have been like shorter then or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's I, I struggle with that so much, man. Like there's so there's so many things like in projects or or even with like other client work where I'll send something and they're like, I'm like I really wanted to keep this or I wanted to do this. And, um, you know, Josh, even he's, he's the guy that I sent it to. And he's like. If you really feel this particular about it, then how can you repurpose that same? Sure, it may not work for this like story film that you're trying to do, but how can you repurpose that? Whether it's like an offshoot social media piece that they can share separately, or you know, the director's cut, or or, literally, (laughs) literally that. I mean, there is some merit to that, and like it's, you know, but like it's still like I don't know. I struggle with that so much. Where like, oh, I love this shot, or I love this section of this interview, and I want to keep it, but it's not, it's not helping the overall goal of what you know what they're trying to achieve with that that it's like ah, but i want to keep it and it's uh yeah I, I struggle with that so much man i mean i'm sure you do and everybody everybody else's but something because i've seen some of your videos where sometimes you'll post on social media where you're like oh i had a 45 minute you know talking head but you yeah. know when the, when the video comes out it's like six minutes long yeah like how do, how do you even like go about like you know choosing <laughs> like what how do you get rid of the fluff or for me most of the time because i've never been super comfortable in front of the camera uh a lot of times i ramble a lot which is why like it's fun practicing podcasts or practicing going live somewhere where i'm like oh this won't be edited (laughs) um and so i'll just ramble about like if i think about something in mid-sentence i'll start going deep dive into that topic before i round trip back to my original point and it's something I've really tried to work on. And thankfully, the magic of editing is I can hear myself afterwards. And so now I can fix it because my videos used to be super long for no reason. I remember the first phone review I did was like the Nexus 5. And I remember the top comment on that video. I don't know if it still is, but it was for a long time of like, you'll thank me later. Go to minute like 530 when he <laughs> actually opens the box. It was a full like five and a half minutes before I even opened the phone box. Wow. And so now like I really try and take some, you know, mindsets that the traditional film world has of storytelling and take that into like YouTube videos where it's like, all right, this doesn't need to be said here. And so those 45 minute A rolls will be a mix of my kid running in and like chilling with me for 10 minutes while I try to get him to go back upstairs. Or uh, if it's late at night and I'm filming and I'm just stumbling on my words and it takes me 10 takes to say something. Um, but most of the time it's just, I say a bunch of useless junk and I just fix it in editing and remove it. Uh, and so I've just gone really good of just trimming being like this isn't needed to be said here um and and yeah it's hard because i've been trying to hit that like 13 to 15 minute mark for videos because that uh longer videos have tend to do better if they're good long videos because more watch time Mm -hmm. because uh i don't mind talking about if it's useful to anyone but last uh last October, November, when I did my biggest videos ever, which was my um, Mac Pro versus uh, Mac Mini M1 when that came out. And that did like 400,000 views in like two or three days, which was like brand new to me. Um, And that video was longer and had a much longer watch time than my first iPhone 12 video which had 
uh, around the same amount of views over the course of like a month, but it had less watch time. So people watch it less. And on the iPhone one, I made like 900 bucks for the same like 400,000 views or 300,000 views at the time. And the Mac Pro versus Mac Mini one uh, made me about uh, just over 4,000. Wow. In odd sense. And that was the most of any video ever. And I'm like, okay, let's keep doing that. Whatever worked for that. Um, and haven't been able to replicate it just since, but working on it. Uh, but it is interesting how like the longer watch times definitely can help. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's interesting too, because like I have, uh, like, even like I said on my channel, like I have some music videos. It's weird how even like the, like there are mo some videos that are monetized and some of the best performing ones are like, even years later, people still like listen to and like watch. And like, I don't know, it's, it's, I've, I've looked into a little bit about like the whole, um, I don't know, if, I don't know if you're familiar with like Cole Bennett or like Miracle mm -hmm. Lemonade. Um, he's like a big music video director and he's kind of, uh, he started off by, he would shoot music videos, kind of doing the same thing where he would post them on his channel and several artists that he had shot videos for like became like very famous, like Juice mm. World and oh, wow. like Lil Skies, like a, a few yeah. other like rappers that are like, have like really well known now, that, yeah. that are well known. So he started making videos and he would post those videos on his channel and gained a whole bunch of success or whatever. So that's kind of where, um, a few years ago when I was, when I was doing, it, I was like, okay, well, I, I'm going to put this up there. And, I, and, and honestly, a lot of the like local artists or like people that I would shoot videos for, they're not they're like, oh, Hey, well, I don't have a YouTube channel. And like that, they weren't really thinking about how, how, how they could like create their own audience platform, et cetera. And like post those things on their own social channels. Um, so I would end up posting them and there was a few videos that, you know, the artist is, pretty well known and people like so like even five years later people still watch the videos and like i'll you know it's it's like i'll look at it every now and then like i'll get like you know two thousand you know views like in in a yeah. two month period or something like that for a video that's five years old but it's because people it's still, funny how that works yeah it's 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 wild but even just seeing like you mentioned like the answer ad sense that like i have a video that has like a couple hundred thousand views and like every now and then like it's i don't you know, like I've made a couple hundred bucks off of that. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Shout out to my wife who, again, she's an actuarial background, uh, which is still hard to explain, but basically just finance money and numbers and crunching all that. And so really learning CPM, watch time and all the things that actually make up because so many people think like, oh, this video got a million views. So how much did you make? It's like, a million views from Graham Stephan's finance channel is going to make so much more money than a million views on a gamer's channel. And so, yeah, it is very interesting to see, like, I'm always open about talking about AdSense, never from like a bragging standpoint, because I always enjoyed watching, again, Graham Stephan was one of the first finance channels that really seemed open about like, hey, here's literally my YouTube studio screen not blocking or blacking out any of the numbers or anything because it I enjoy it because it's like oh this is what's possible like this is what you can do obviously I'm not a finance channel so like I'm envious of that I wish I knew more about talking about stocks and credit and stuff because finance channels make bank right now if anyone's listening yes. if you know finance <laughs> stuff make a YouTube channel and you'll make a killing um, uh, but I just always liked hearing at different subscriber levels and at different view levels, like, oh, this person makes X amount of dollars. It's like, oh, I didn't know at 50,000 you can, you know, make X or at 10,000 you can make a living um, and be full-time creator. And so it's it's always interesting to see. So that's why, like, I don't know, I've always been open to talking about it too. And so even when, like, factoring a lot of those, like, metrics and, and things like that, it's like it's – and it's it's weird right because like earlier we were talking about like yeah you don't really need to pay attention to any of that stuff to get you know that that shouldn't be the driving force to sure. get started but obviously as you start to you know gain some success and and start you know seeing these opportunities present themselves you know what are some things to like look look for and like even to consider as you start you know reaching that point where oh hey this i've been doing this thing long enough that i can see the potential and be, it being monetized and i can you know how do you even like go about like 
really leveraging that being able to like monetize because it's not just turning on the ad sets. I mean, sure. you mentioned it a little bit earlier where, you know, you have sponsorships and affiliate links and, and things like that. But like, what are, uh, I, I guess, you know, how do you even like go about thinking like yeah. what's, what's, what's your approach to thinking about that, especially as a creator, who, you know, that's getting into that threshold, right? It's hard, right? Cause there are some creators who have like diehard integrity and, Marquez is always the first name that comes up because before his like Volvo video or something, he never had a super obvious like sponsored video. And that's why people respect it. And and to this day, 10 years later, that's why he won creator of the decade. That's not the only reason why, but that's a huge reason is you can trust what he says because, you know, every video is not like this video is sponsored by blah, blah, blah. Um, Especially when that product is the one being featured in the video. And so there's, it's a mix of like, oh, I need to pay bills and support my family. Um, But also you are playing the long game and you want to retain the integrity of whatever channel. So I have yet to receive some email from some company that I wouldn't work with, offer me a crazy amount of money. And I'm very scared for that day because I don't know, like, I have pretty decent integrity. If someone, you know, brings an obviously terrible company, it's pretty easy to say no to that. But if it's like, oh, this isn't really relative to my audience, but what's that number on that check again? Like, yeah. you know, I, I think so many people aren't like open to like talking about that. And I'm just like, listen, like, I mean, like you said, money's not the driver, right? Money is in my head. Just, like, money doesn't buy happiness, but it buys the freedom that can then allow you to do whatever you want. And so for me, now that I've ventured into the sponsorship realm, it's more about just like, okay, what's fair? And it's also, you have to think, um, Emilio uh, Takas, I think I said his last name right, he gave me great advice recently. We were FaceTiming, and um, he put me in touch with a company, and I was like, oh, like, what number should I throw out there and all this stuff? I'm worried, like, my views haven't been, like, getting as much, so what are they going to think? And he's like, people will sponsor sometimes to try and get in early, so even if you're not massing crazy amounts of views, that, like you said, like, a year later, six months later, five years later, a video can just explode out of nowhere, and I've had multiple videos do that where, I upload them, they're complete duds, I forget about them, and then six months later, I'm like, wait, why is the channel getting this many views? And it's like, oh, that one video just got like 30,000 views in the past month. And so there are videos um, that I did at the end of last year where it's like, oh, this sponsor would give me like a thousand bucks or something and do this video. And I was so concerned about like getting them a decent return uh, through like their affiliate links or whatever. And, um, you know, I would just like stress over that completely. And Emilio was just like, you know, one video is going to take some time. And now I've, you know, that video and other videos like it have, um, given that company a much more decent return than, than what they paid out to me. And also it's kind of spot, uh, brands and companies taking a chance on what they think where you could be in a year or two. And, so that really opened my eyes to the sponsorship thing too. Cause again, I thought that it would, I'd be at the silver play button or something when like sponsors would start rolling in. And here I am hearing other creators being like, no, five or 10,000 subscribers. I was like getting checks from this, that, and the other. And I'm just like, how? <laughs> like, so it's, yeah, it, it's pretty interesting. And I've always heard that like AdSense and affiliates should be like bonuses. Like that shouldn't be the thing that you rely on because this past month or two has been stressful just because advertising revenue usually goes down at the beginning of the year. Um, And so trying to come up with more business strategies to, to find revenue streams in as many areas as possible while again, all still maintaining the integrity of the channel because the second your audience starts smelling that you're only doing this for the money or they don't really believe in a product that you're selling you're going to get called out on out for it and you know it 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 may not be the end of the world but it's it's going to ruin some amount of integrity so like when do you know when do you know that it's that time to like start pursuing that or 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 even think about i 
Um, honestly, my answer is different than what it would have been like a month ago after talking to people. I don't think there's a wrong time. I remember when I had 500 or like a thousand subscribers, I got a phone call with, um, who was it? Lens pro to go. And I wasn't even trying to get money. I was just trying to get like, I don't know, a rental, uh, amount of money or something like that. So I could like rent a camera to test out and looking back on it, I've always laughed of like th- that guy was awesome to at least humor me. Cause I, here I am with like 500 subscribers getting like dozens of views. And, uh, he literally let me rant for like 30 minutes or something like, Oh, like, you know, it was a, it was a fun practicing of a pitch. And, you know, at the time it was just like, Oh, like right now I'm not, um, uh, you know, call me back in like six months or a year or something like that. Um, so I don't think there's any wrong time to at least venture into it. You're probably going to get a lot of no's just as you will when you get larger. But um, I've always been bad at asking for money, especially money that like I think is a fair valuation. Like I know my value, but it's always freaked me out to be like, okay, here's the number. Because I'm always scared of getting ghosted or just flat out being like, I don't know, laughed at and like, um, again, because I want to make sure that it like I then return the value to that company. And so, yeah, it's I don't think there's a wrong time to do it. I think it's good to get as much practice in as you can. But definitely like, I mean, and even when those opportunities present present themselves, that make sure that, you know, you are it it, it falls in line with like that integrity that you talked about, because I mean, even with me, like it's you know, I really have no huge social following of, of any sort. And I've had brands reach out and, hey, you know, re- we have this microphone or this thing. And yeah. like, do you want to review it? And like, I've had people, you know, reach out and, and I'm like, nah, that's not, it's not really something that like I'm interested in doing because it's like, I already know like this thing is trash or I'm probably not going to, I'm not going to be interested in it. Like, I don't want to be, I don't know. I don't, like early on, I don't want to be find myself like getting caught in being that guy. Like, oh, you're pitching this this thing that's like no good. And yeah, and, I mean, even like last year, I had a, a, a company send some a product out to like review and like test out, and I did the video, and they did. You know, it was mostly like it wasn't very good. It wasn't. It was. It was mostly negative, and it wasn't like I wasn't like straight up bashing it. But I was sure. like, yeah, I had a hard time using this, and I didn't really enjoy my experience with it. And that's what it was. And they like, yeah, well, no, like I, it's unacceptable. Like we can't, you know, we sent you this thing, and you they know, just want know. a free commercial. <laughs> that's really what it ends up being. And like, and like that really like left a sour taste in my mouth, man. Because I was like, oh, like oh, here I, I thought it was like oh, I, you know, some they sent me out something to to try out, and I did this video and. And, you know, it wasn't like any large amount of money and, you know, I ended up getting the product or whatever, but I was like, that whole experience like left just a sour taste in my mouth. Sure. Like, I mean, I was honest about it. And like, I even told them like, yeah, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say these things because it's not true. And, like, I literally had a hard time like setting it, putting it together. And it was like one of these like audio interfaces mm. and they had like this whole like auto game feature. And like, that was like the big thing that they were pitching and like, Oh, well you didn't talk about them. Like, yeah. Cause I, whenever I try to use it, it was horrible. And like here, it, like it ruined like the whole like video and the whole experience for me. And like, you know, we yeah, just the being whole, honest, you know, we did, even, even after like doing like the whole troubleshooting and like they sent me with like their tech and like, Hey, maybe you got a bad, bad unit. Yada, yada, check this, check that. And it was just like a horrible experience. I'm like, damn, like, I don't know if I want to do this a lot. Yeah. Like, it's and, and that's kind of where I'm like, I, I, I want to start reaching out to like, you know, people like people that I want to work with. And I mean, I, I guess I, should just- I think you'll find the companies that because Gerald undone. I literally last night was watching a video. I think it was on Sony, uh, Sony one. I don't know. One of Sony's cameras. Um, I believe it was Sony. And he was like, like you said, I'm not going to bash this, but like this camera doesn't really make sense or something. And he was like, I literally emailed Sony before posting this being like, Hey, just so you know, like this video is not going to be super favorable of this product. Um, Would you like me to hold off until you can like give me a replacement or or whatever? So then I can at least um, come back and potentially 
change uh, the opinions. And so, again, whoever camera company it was, uh, was like, no, go ahead and, and post it. And he was like, so good on them for at least being willing to, you know, hear the tough criticism or whatever. And so I think those companies that are generally trying to get feedback from people and not just a free five-star commercial um, will be willing to to take the hits. And especially if you're communicate, um, if, if you communicate the issues you have before uh, posting and not saying you didn't do this, but anyone else who's listening, who makes content like this, if you're talking to the company, like you said, of like, Hey, I've experienced this. Do you have a fix for that? Like maybe I just got a buggy unit. Oh no, that's just how it is. Okay. Well then like, I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> and, and yeah, and I think as you move up to the more reputable companies, usually you're going to like, at least in my experience, have a better experience. It's always like the cheap Amazon resellers, again, who just want to sell their product. They're not passionate about their brand or their company. And, um, you know, those are the ones that always are way more work than what any sort of affiliate or sponsorship money is usually worth. How do they find you? Because like I've been recently, I've been getting an influx of like those Amazon resellers (laughs) where, oh, hey, we have this thing and, you know, we want to... You have great video, like let's you know. all the generic stuff, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for it's my guess is it's always because my because on most people's YouTube channels you have like the contact on the about page, and so usually you just get sourced from that email. Yeah, so I've been getting it. I've had an influx of those recently where they're like for like these like random products and like they're all like filmmaking type sure. related stuff, but it's like yeah. I, I, I wouldn't even like buy this. I wouldn't even get this to like my kid who's, you know, sure. He's like my son starting to get an interest into this. Stuff. I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't even give that to him. <laughs> yeah. But there are like, especially starting out. Cause I think we've both done videos on products that aren't like, Oh, a really cool camera body or whatever. Usually when you start out and start to get a little traction, you get those like medium sized companies where it's like the camera accessory. So it's not the main camera. But it's like, oh, here's a wireless transmitter or here's an audio interface. And my biggest advice there, too, is like try to stand out from the basic reviews because I used to do just like plain old review of like, again, that video transmitter. And they never really did all that well. And then I would see people who do like vlogging and stuff like, again, Peter McKinnon, Maddie and and others who that would be the subject of the video, but they had a whole story around of like, oh, I'm trying to do the shoot, or I'm trying to do this. And then they would just sprinkle that product in and show its use cases. But it wasn't like a, okay, here's 10 minutes dedicated to this product with the this little tech specs. That, yeah. Exactly. And so like there's, those are good from like a tutorial. Like those are good evergreen videos. Like, oh, how to use this, how to set up, how to uh, make this work. This has a bug. Let me show you how to fix it. Those are great searchable videos because if there is a widespread problem, it's like my Blackmagic 6K Pro tint issue. Like that video did pretty good because a lot of people are worried about the tint issue. So I talk about like, oh, these are the possible fixes and blah, blah, blah. Um, But other than that, if you want to do just like review, try to take that small product and work it into like a bigger idea and it will uh, stand out from the crowd. So as we start to wrap up, you know, I feel like I'm 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 glad that we you touched on a lot a few different topics that like I wanted to, to to talk about, especially for you know people who are like in the YouTube space or you know even like just content creation. Because I feel like a lot of these things, you know, not only work for like YouTube but can also be used for Instagram or TikTok or whatever other social media. Um, like I know the episode before this. I had Landon Mooney. I don't know if you've come across any Mm-mm. Strictly Apple. I don't know if you've come across any stuff on oh, TikTok. Oh, yeah. So I had him on a podcast. He's from Columbus. Really? Yeah. Huh. So he's, you know, used TikTok to, like, grow his business. And like, he li- he literally was in his bedroom before all that started. He was, literally was in his bedroom <laughs> fixing a- 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 iPhones and, like, computers. And then started growing on tiktok because he was posting videos of like the stuff that he was fixing and got into like a small office now he's like in this big you know corporate big big warehouse where he's like literally getting getting 
computers and phone set from all over the world sure for like fixing off of like just yeah. posting videos on social media um so I, I guess do you have any, like any cl- like closing thoughts as to like somebody who was wanting to start creating or doing things for themselves or or even have you know doesn't necessarily have to be you know already a creator whether doing client work filmmaking or whatever but you know maybe you know like you mentioned your wife your wife's in finance or somebody who's like in, in, in any other like that has different varying interests like and want to get started with a youtube channel or just creating content in general sure yeah i mean the biggest thing i would say is what if you already have an interest then or ahead of the game, you know what you kind of want to make, just start creating stuff and testing out the audience. That's kind of, you know, while you're waiting to get monetized, there's really like no pressure, like just upload stuff, see what works. And if you find something that is gaining traction and you enjoy making it, lean into that and don't try like diversifying all over the place in different topics um, and just kind of get, laser focused on what's working for you then. And if it starts to run out, then, you know, you can pivot from there. But the biggest thing is, you know, we talked a lot about both specific ideas and SEO and all that. Just know that you'll learn all that stuff over time and you're not going to learn it overnight. And I've always been a self-taught person who just likes little information nuggets and, So if you just take one or two from every time you talk to someone or listen to a podcast or watch a video, then over time you'll kind of build out what works for you and and what you want. But it's the most cliche thing, but the biggest thing is just do it because you're going to regret it if you don't. Sweet. Well, Michael, thank you for coming on the Creative Blog Podcast. Thanks for having me. Until next time. Thanks, dude.